It seems that students of the modern world and their reputation for drunken debauchery aren't too dissimilar to students of the medieval world. Let's travel back in time and learn about learning in the Middle Ages. Welcome to Medieval Madness. During the Middle Ages, most rulers increased their power through either birthright or war. Education played very little, if any, part in their success, and fighting skills were much more important. And although the influence of both Roman and Germanic cultures could be seen all over Europe, in the justice system and society as a whole, it was the church that became the guiding force when developing a medieval educational system. This religious influence meant that bishops, monks, and priests became responsible for teaching and for the organisation of education as a whole. By 1330, just 5% of the European population were given any sort of formal education, because for most people it was not considered necessary. Only as kingdoms became larger and more complex was the need for administrational skills such as writing and arithmetic thought crucial. And even then, instruction was usually only available to the nobility if they desired it. Meanwhile, those of the lower classes could not afford the educational fees required to attend monasteries and cathedral schools, and were usually put to work in childhood. By the time they had reached the age of about 12, they were already considered an adult. The system was deliberately designed to keep the serfs uneducated. In addition, and in order to keep the workers in their place, the lord of the manor had to keep his permission for any peasant child to be taught. Anyone caught being schooled without permission would be fined. Of course, the children of peasants would be taught the skills that they needed to survive through work from their own parents. Boys would be taken into the fields by their fathers to learn farming, and girls would help to cook, tend to the animals, cultivate the vegetable patch, or perhaps watch their mother spinning or weaving. Boys Books were a rare commodity, and being highly expensive, the only way to become educated was through the passing on of knowledge from a teacher. Highly influenced by the church, the boys were taught to read and write in Latin. The ancient texts of Greece and Rome were followed to teach logic, rhetoric, and grammar, known as the trivium, which are the three fundamental liberal arts, as well as the four other more complicated liberal arts of astrology, music, arithmetic, and geometry, although many of the courses were based on theory and superstition. The boys sat together on the floor during lessons, which began early in the morning and ended at sunset. This meant that classes lasted for much longer during the summer months. As vellum was made from animal skin and expensive, and the use of paper and ink could only be afforded by the highest ranking nobles and monasteries, note-taking was done on wooden tablets filled with either black or green wax. A stylus made from ivory or bone was used to scratch words into the surface. Paper would only be given to those students who had perfected their writing skills, and only then if they had the funds to pay for it. This resulted in huge quantities of information having to be memorised by heart. Corporal punishment was used not just for bad behaviour, but also for mistakes. This was usually in the form of birching, where a birch rod would be used to hit the bare buttocks of a child. It was thought that the mistake would never be made again, for fear of the punishment. Boys who were intended to become knights were fostered into another knight's home to learn their skills. In the 11th and 12th centuries, the code of chivalry was proposed by the church and was expected to be followed, so it was important that knights could read and write in order to understand and follow the rules, which included fearing God and the church, serving the liege lord, protecting the weak, showing no mercy to the infidel, and respecting the honour of women. Any knight who could not read or write was looked down upon. girls. Only a small section of the female population would receive any formal education. In Europe, this generally took place in a nunnery. After basic instruction, many girls would decide to take vows themselves, join the religious order, and leave out a cloistered life. Others began their convent education around the age of seven, and were educated until they were ready for marriage, usually around the age of 14. A convent curriculum consisted of reading and writing, music, manners, and ethics, as well as practical skills such as spinning, weaving, and embroidery. In fact, it was embroidery that nuns spent most of their time doing. Sewing pictures of Bible stories and tales from Greek mythology meant that a good knowledge of literature and history was needed. Music was also important because the chants were sung for the glory of God. Because of the regularity of invasion and war during the period, many nuns taught surgery and medicine to other women. 
Some nunneries would teach the classical writings and the liberal arts like those taught to boys. Many well-educated nuns became abbesses and were treated on an equal footing to their male counterparts. Sometimes when they were just into their early teens, they would have control over large properties and write treaties on rhetoric and logic and were generally quite powerful. Those girls lucky enough to be born into noble households usually had a personal nurse until the age of about seven and were then taught academic work by chaplains. As men were often away fighting, girls were taught about household management and medicine in case the men returned ill or wounded. Girls also learned the social graces like singing, dancing, deportment, and the art of conversation. Equestrian skills and an understanding of chess, dice games, and falconry were prized, and young ladies were taught hospitality, etiquette, and to moderate their voices at all times. Even for the peasant classes, it was mostly in the home where the skills and information that girls needed was transmitted. Mothers and fathers were responsible for teaching religion and passing on any basic reading and writing skills that they had. Mothers also taught their daughters household skills and whatever medical knowledge they had acquired. Generally, married life and the raising of children were the main goals for a medieval girl. Women were under the protection of men, and whatever education they could complete was intended to help them become a better wife and mother. Monastic schools Headed by the Vatican, monastic schools were part of a monastery and run by an order such as the Benedictine or the Franciscan monks. Education was nearly always meant to lead to a life of working in the religious community. Focus was given to studying and copying the works of Greek and Roman philosophers, polymaths, and physicians. Certain monastic schools even studied more contentious topics like botany and physics. Some of these schools would allow the teaching of boys from poor families, but they would have to serve in the cathedral in order to be considered for the opportunity. Grammar schools by the 11th century, the merchants began to emerge as the new middle class, and some of these successful merchants came from the lower classes. As new towns sprang up, they attracted more specialist traders such as apothecaries, grocers, and cobblers. Guilds were set up, and wealthy merchants began to establish and fund local schools for the education of their own children. These schools became known as grammar schools. The teaching of Latin grammar was essential as it was the language used by many of the European merchants. Latin was a universal language across the continent, and anyone wanting to trade successfully in Europe needed to have a working knowledge of the language. The education of a merchant's son would ensure that his business could continue. During the late medieval period, subjects were expanded to include the teaching of English, as well as other European languages, geography, and the natural sciences. Most schools were small, with just one room. A single tutor would teach the older boys, who were then expected to teach the younger ones. At the age of 14 or 15, some students would go on to continue their education at university. Universities By the end of the 11th century, universities had begun to appear. At first, they were just groups of ecclesiastical tutors who would meet with students in houses or churches and even in public parks with the purpose of learning. Later, buildings were rented and then built specifically for their needs. In the beginning, university students studied divinity as they were intended to later work in some capacity within the church. However, during the later Middle Ages, many wealthy merchants and nobles wished for their sons to study law or medicine. The first university was founded in 1088 in Bologna, northern Italy, but this was closely followed by Oxford in England, which was expanded after King Henry II banned English students from attending the University of Paris in 1167. There was hostility between the students and townsfolk from the beginning, which resulted in the outbreaks of violence and rioting. In 1354, a riot broke out when two Oxford scholars complained about the standard of wine in a tavern. The unrest lasted for three days, several towns' buildings and colleges were ransacked, and many townspeople and students were killed. A few universities in Europe specialised in specific subjects. One would best study medicine at Salerno in southern Italy, theology in Paris, or attend Bologna for law. By the 1500s, many of these universities had gained such an excellent reputation that both tutors and scholars were travelling from all over Europe to teach and study in them. Many of these medieval universities are still great centres of learning today. Because young men found themselves far away from home and unsupervised during their studies, they developed a reputation for drunkenness and shameless behaviour. They were often condemned for their use of prostitutes and for drinking and gambling. 
This is interesting when one considers that during the 1400s, one third of men, who were later given a high position in the clergy, such as bishops, archbishops and cardinals, attended university. A typical day started with study between 5 and 6 a.m. and students were expected to be fluent in Latin by this point so that they could speak and deliberate logically in the language. A Bachelor of Arts degree was awarded after three or four years of studying the liberal arts and a Master's after a further three years. Then the student could go on to the higher fields of law, medicine or theology, which was considered the most prestigious degree during the Middle Ages. This could take up to an additional six to twelve years for a Master's or Doctorate. As Europe emerged from the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance, it had reached high levels of attainment in its universities and great developments in art, literature and science. And it seemed that the medieval period created the basis for the educational system that we still use today. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. I do hope that you've enjoyed and learned a thing or two, and please do subscribe if you'd like to see more videos, as we do release them every week. Cheers.